Romans chapter 11. We're on Sunday mornings, in addition to our prophecy updates, going through this amazing epistle, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and we'll pick it up in verse 16 today, and we'll go through to verse 24. So once you find your way there, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. If you're unable, that's all right. Uh, you can follow along with me either way as I read the text. The Apostle Paul is writing by the Holy Spirit and says, If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast, verse 18, over those branches. If you do, consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. If Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For, verse 21, if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, Verse 24, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, wow. This is one of those passages that makes us realize how much we need for your Holy Spirit to give us eyes of understanding and give us the ability to really comprehend all that we've just read that's here. Lord, we know that it's here for a reason, that you inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, to write this and to record this, and you deemed it necessary to include this in the canon of Scripture so there must be a reason. Lord, we want to know what that reason is today, how this applies to us today. So Lord, will you speak? Your servants are listening. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is going to be part three of a series I've titled, God Hasn't Given Up On Me. The reason I chose this title for this series is because the Jews had assumed in God favoring the Gentiles, grafting in the Gentiles, that he was through with the Jew, that he had, in effect, replaced the Jew, given up on the Jew. And so in this jealousy of the Gentile who are now the recipients of God grafting them in, naturally they concluded that, well, that must be what God has done. He's rejected us, which is why Paul would ask, has God rejected his people? Only to answer, God forbid. Absolutely not. God has not given up on you to the Jew, he would say. Well, they would say, wait a minute. He seems to have favored now these despicable Gentiles. Which, by the way, to the Jew, the Gentile was despicable. And by the way, if you're here today and you're not a Jew, then you are a despicable Gentile in the eyes of the Jew. And God has seemingly favored you over them. But that's not synonymous to say that God in so doing has rejected them. 
But Paul still has a problem. He still has to address this and reconcile this and even argue this to them as to why it is that God would graft in these wild olive shoots, these Gentiles, as we'll see here with our fifth one, uh, found in verses 16 through 19. God is not through with me like he's not through with them. Why? Because it's not about me. This wasn't about them as Jews. It's certainly not about us as Gentiles. It, it's not predicated on who we are, what we've done, how bad we've been. It's how good and kind he is. And that's what Paul is going to demonstrate here in a really gnarly way. Now, I have to kind of warn you because it is a gnarly passage. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, and I don't know what any other word to use to describe it. I'm sure there are other more pastoral words other than gnarly, but until I come up with a better one, that's the one I'm going to use. I mean, if, if, if you're honest, uh, at first read, how many of you, as I was reading the passage and you were following along, your response was, huh? Okay, yeah, I thought raise your hands. It's okay. God sees your heart. He knows. And, uh, but I mean, first fruits, branches, all the shoots, the root. Well, what does all this mean? Well, verse 16, Paul says, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. And if the root is holy, then so too are the branches holy. In verse 17, he says, if some branches are broken off, and though as a wild olive shoot, branches are grafted in among the others, they would share in the nourishing sap. Then in verses 18 and 19, he says, don't boast over those branches. Why? Because the branches grafted in don't support the root. The root supports you. They broke off so you could be grafted in. Okay, what's Paul saying here? Well, it is absolutely fascinating. Not only what he says, but how he says it. The imagery he uses to say it. Now, this presents a dilemma because it's riddled with symbolism and not necessarily symbolism that we would understand in our day. But that's not to say that they didn't know exactly what Paul was talking about in their day. Now, my hope is, is that we'll give the Holy Spirit permission to teach us what this means to us. Because it's too easy to just sort of dismiss this as being chiefly about them and for them then, thus having no application to us now. And nothing could be further from the truth. First and foremost, we need to know what's meant by first fruits, being holy. Some commentators believe it's speaking of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think it's about verse 25, Paul is going to allude to uh, the patriarchs. So yes, I, I believe the first fruits could be referring to uh, supremely the patriarchs, but others believe, and I am in this camp as well, that these first fruits are speaking of the first church, because the first church was made up of this Jewish root, and the Gentile Christians were grafted in to that Jewish root. See? So I think it's not either or. I never want to limit my interpretation of God's word to an either or answer because I think that it's too dangerously close to limiting God in the sense that maybe it refers to both. And it certainly can because both would certainly fit what Paul is saying here concerning these first fruits. Now here's how I get there. Both the patriarchs and the early church have had the effect of sanctifying the whole batch because of their roots. The reason I say that is because there's this reference 
in Numbers 15, where the Israelites' first fruits that were offered and given to the Lord would sanctify the rest of the batch. This is akin to our tithing today. We give the Lord the first fruits of our wealth, of our income, and when we do, God is able to bless the rest of the batch, the 90% that he lets us keep, is in a sense sanctified, made holy, blessed, if you prefer. Now, that's not to say that all Israel, though rejecting Christ, are automatically saved having this first fruit root. See, this was their mindset, is that we're God's chosen people. So as such, we're saved. We're the first first fruit. fruit. You try to say that. Fruit, 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 root. We're the first fruits. Can you imagine how devastating it would have been to their Jewish pride to have God graft in these wild olive shoots called Gentiles? How wild is that? <laughs> we are those wild olive shoots that are grafted in to this Jewish first fruit root. There, that came out pretty good. Hope you got that, because I don't know if I could ever say that again that well. This is the recovery plan that, that Paul had mentioned in the previous verses that we looked at last week, in verses 11 through 15, that they had not fallen, they had not been cut off beyond that which could be recovered. God still had a restoration plan, a recovery plan for his people in that he would graft them back in, but not after the grafting in of these wild olive shoots, these Gentiles into the root. Here's how God's recovery plan or plan of restoration, if you prefer, works. In Israel, in that day, again, this is the imagery that they would have understood. They knew exactly what Paul was saying when he would write this. See, when an old olive tree had lost its vigor, they would have to cut off the branches that weren't fruitful, essentially pruning it. Subsequent to the pruning, they would then graft in some wild olive shoots, which in turn would reinvigorate the olive tree and make it fruitful again. For those of you who went to Israel with us, uh, the couple of times we went, uh, when we were in the Garden of Gethsemane, do you remember those olive trees that were there? Some believe that those are the very same olive trees that were there when Jesus was there. How cool is that? Olive trees can live a very long time. The root is old, but can be reinvigorated vis-a-vis these wild olive shoots. You need to tell me that God reinvigorated the Jewish root by grafting in the Gentile? Well, no wonder the Jews are having a problem with this. In other words, thanks to the Gentiles being grafted in, that the tree has been reinvigorated. Well, Paul is going to deal with that here in a minute because there's an arrogance that can come from that. Well, if it weren't for us, you know, you Jews, if it weren't for us Gentiles being grafted in, then this tree would be no more. Well, again, Paul's going to deal with that, but the imagery here is so amazing, and it's so beautifully displayed with none other than Ruth in the Old Testament. Ruth, who was a Moabite, it was said of her, was this godly shoot engrafted into Israel to reinvigorate Israel, grafted in as a Gentile. I just, I can't wait till we get to the book of Ruth, which we're going to get there pretty soon. Not before the rapture, maybe, but maybe we will. We're in the book of Judges now, so we're there. We're close. This is where the Gentile comes into this amazing scripture picture, as I like to call it. Like Ruth, we, as the Gentiles, are that wild olive shoot that's grafted in. Think this through with me. Just as the wild olive shoot grafted in reinvigorates the tree, so too does the Jews' jealousy 
being provoked to jealousy, which again, the Apostle Paul's going to bring back up again, it reinvigorates the Jews because they're jealous of our relationship with their God. See how this all beautifully fits? See how Paul is just brilliantly by the Holy Spirit just making sense out of all of this for them in the midst of their notion that somehow God had given up on them? No, God hasn't given up on them. It's not about them. Well, yes, because it's about the Gentiles. No, it's not about the Gentiles either. See, just as the Gentile provokes the Jew to jealousy, drawing them back in, so too does the wild branch of the Gentile graft the Jew back in. Now, we still have a problem because the Gentiles are going to fancy themselves as having been accepted in this grafting in at the expense of the Jews who have been rejected. So not only is this a problem for the Jews, this can become a problem of pride for the Gentiles. One commentator, I think, just nails the uh, head, head of the nail, the hammer on the head, you know that, uh, whatever, <laughs> however it goes. He says this, It is a matter for profound regret that just as Israel refused to accept this salvation when it was offered to them, the Gentiles have all too often refused to make Israel envious. Instead of showing to God's ancient people the attractiveness of the Christian way, Christians have characteristically treated the Jews with hatred, prejudice, persecution, and malice, and all uncharitableness. Christians should not take this passage calmly. By the way, this has its root, no pun intended, in replacement theology, which satanically teaches that the church has replaced Israel as God's elect, as God's chosen people, entitled to all of the promises that were given to Israel, now belong to the church, that God is through with Israel, and now it's all about the church. This is that. And this is the very thing that Paul warns against to the Gentile. Don't you think for a second that God is through with the Jew. God has a plan, a recovery plan for the Jew. This explains why Paul would go to great lengths to explain that there's nothing wrong with this first fruit root and that it's not about those who have been grafted in. Perhaps better said, as Paul said, we, as that wild shoot, don't support the root. The root supports us such that we in no way can boast. We can't say it's because of us that the tree exists. If it weren't for the wild olive shoot grafted in to reinvigorate the tree, the tree wouldn't exist. And what Paul's saying is be very careful, as we'll see here next. Absent this Jewish root, we as Gentiles would not exist. It's the other way around. While the Jewish root can exist without us, we in turn cannot exist without the root. Were it not for the Jew, then there would be no me and you. Hey, that's, got a little ring. <laughs> that's got a little ring to it. See, and the opposite side of the table, it's, well, if it weren't for me, if it weren't for us, if it weren't for the church, you know, and so all of a sudden now, here comes this, this attitude of, well, thanks to me. The tree owes me. It's all about me. You know that worship song, and I know I bring it up all the time. I don't know when the last time we sung this song is. Maybe that's a good thing, but you know, it goes like this. It's all about you, Jesus. You, you, you sing that song? Yeah? Do you? Yeah. You're lying. This, it's not about you, Lord. It's about me, Lord. It's about me. It's all about me. I've made, I've made this about me. If it weren't for me, you should be so glad to have me in your kingdom. 
I mean, we have this romantic idea that when we gave our lives to Christ, the angels in heaven and they're rejoicing and partying because one sinner has repented that they're going, oh, this is great. We got JD in the kingdom of God. No. <laughs> I would suggest to you that it's the other way around. They're in heaven going, he's giving his life to you, Lord. Are you going to accept it? That's the greater miracle, is it not? Well, this is going to dovetail into our sixth one and last one for today in verses 20 through 24. It's because of God's kindness. Now, in verses 20 and 21, Paul says, the Jews are broken off by unbelief, so as Gentiles, they shouldn't be arrogant. Instead, they should be afraid. Why? Because God didn't spare natural branches, speaking of the Jews, thus he may not spare them either as the grafted in Gentiles. Then in verses 22 and 23, he takes it a step further and he says, really explaining why that is, he says, God's sternness is to those who fall and his kindness is to those who do not persist in unbelief because God will graft them in again. And then in verse 24, he says, if those cut out of an olive tree wild by nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will the natural ones be? Again, what's Paul saying here? It's riddled with symbols which once again require us to give the Holy Spirit permission to give us eyes to see and kind of sort it out and work it out as it relates to its application to our lives. I think in order to understand what Paul is saying, we may do well to first understand what it is that Paul is not saying, especially concerning one's salvation. Paul is not saying we can be cut off and lose our salvation. Uh, there is a, a certain sect in Christianity that actually teaches that you can lose your salvation. So, you know, every week you've got to respond to the altar call just to make sure you're saved still, right? Because you can lose your salvation. That's not what Paul is saying here. What he is saying is we ourselves can cut ourselves off. How, how do we do it? Well, we can do it the same way the Jews did it, unbelief unbelief. We don't continue on in the kindness of God. We don't stay grafted in to the love of God. In our un well, what pray tell would cause such an unbelief as to be cut off of our own doing? Well, I think it can be this notion that somehow it's all about me. Now stay with me, and I'll try to tie it all together here as we close. The reason Paul says this is because if it's not due to God's kindness, then it will be due to our own arrogance. See, that cutting off, that unbelief that leads to this being cut off will be because we think that we're so good. And can't be cut off. That's what the Jew did. And in addition to this, Paul is saying that it's easier to keep the Jews grafted in than it is to graft the Gentiles in. So in other words, don't think it's about you and, and just because God has grafted you in. No, it's because of God's kindness that you were grafted in. Continue in that kindness so that you too can be nourished from the sap from the root. If it weren't for the root, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Paul wouldn't be writing this epistle, saying this to them. Well, this is where I'd like to close. I'm just going to say it this way. In closing, if the onus is on me and God's kindness to me is all about me, then no wonder I'll think that God is through with me. 
I know there's probably simpler ways to say that. I know that's complicated. I have the gift of complication. I could take something so simple in God's Word and I could just make it so complicated to understand. But here's the bottom line. If I think it's about me, then it's not going to be about God's kindness to me. We cannot live our Christian lives that way. If we do, we'll be what James describes as being tossed about to and fro as every wave, poor uh, illustration after a tsunami warning, but <laughs> like every wave, being, <laughs> it's a gift, being tossed to and fro. We're unstable in all of our ways because we might have a good week one week, a bad week the next week, and if it's predicated upon that, if it's the onus is on me, then no wonder I'm thinking, well, you know, I had a pretty bad week, so, you know, God's pretty ticked at me, so, uh, you know, God's not going to have anything to do with me. That means you've made it about you and not his kindness. See, his kindness is everlasting and faithful and unending. And if it's predicated upon his kindness and not on you, then you'll never have that doubt, doubt being tossed to, to and fro about on that sea of uncertainty. There will be no doubt. God is for me. He goes before me. And if he is for me, who can be against me? He can certainly not be through with me, nor could he have given up on me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Again, this is one of those times where we are keenly aware that unless the Holy Spirit builds this into our lives, that we're going to labor in vain if we even try in, our, in and of our own selves. Lord, would you now take what we've seen here today with all of the magnificent imagery and open up our eyes to it, open up our hearts to it, that we might apply our lives to it. Lord, forgive us for making it about us and not about you. Lord, thank you for your kindness. In Jesus' name.